Kara. Yeah. Yes, okay. I am. I, I, I okay. co-teach a lot. And like I said, my co-founder, Felicia Fay Love, uh, was very involved in the Black Lives Matter and in uh, racial and social justice. So um, I'm carrying on her legacy right now. And, um, and we can talk about that at the end. I um, want to just um, cover some, some of the, the things that uh, I learned so that uh, other people can um, into full screen. Can learn. So in 1984, uh, my friend Francis Payne Adler, who was a poet, and I were are in our undergraduate classes at San Diego State University, and we were journalism majors. I was photojournalism, and we were publishing a school magazine at that time together. And um, we were in a political science class and the Attorney General of the United States <clears throat> said there was no documentable evidence <clears throat> of hunger in the United States. No documentable evidence of hunger. So you know how when somebody says something to you like that and, and you go, your body just feels that it's not true. I was a single mom with two little kids going to college <clears throat> and I, um, I was living close to downtown San Diego at the time. And I saw people homeless every day outside where I lived. And so um, Fran started banging the desk in our, in our political science class like, <laughs> saying, somebody should do something, somebody should do something. And uh, the professor looked at us and he says, well, why don't you do something? And we were going, what? We're just students. What do we know how to do? And, and we <laughs> learned that um, by combining the arts with people that are working it for social justice, you have a really strong tool. And it's a tool that a lot of artists don't take advantage of. And so um, the first exhibition we did was called Home Street Home. And we even had a friend do needlepoint for the exhibition. The frames were 30 by 40 inches. And then inside that frame were life-size photographs that I printed myself, silver gelatin, selenium toned prints that were 24 by 24. So that each, each piece in the exhibition um, had a story and that, and it had facts and it had quotes. And the mayor in San Diego saw the exhibition and initiated a task force. So, one of the things that I would like to encourage artists and professors and communities is if you hear someone say, because of your work or because of this, this happened or I changed. And this is what, this is what we learned to do. And very few artists really pay attention to it, but it's what we need to do, in my opinion, especially with art to change the world. I mean, to show that there is Sorry, I have a cat behind me. <laughs> there is um, a, a, a cause and effect that art really does have an effect on people. So the mayor initiated a task force uh, to study homelessness. This is a photograph that I took. Uh, it's actually from a color slide, so it's a little fuzzy, but it was one of the first photographs I took. I was driving downtown and I was already working at PBS at the time as staff photographer, uh, part-time while I was going to co college. And this woman obviously had spent the night sitting by her shopping cart with her crutches on the ground and, um, and behind her a box that says uh, fragile handle with care. And she's got the, a green garbage bag on her head and purple socks on her hands. It was just like, I jumped in front of a bus to take that photograph <laughs> because <laughs> it was one of those things where you see it and you go, oh my goodness, you know, it's like, it's a story in itself. And, and here, is, this is a, a homeless shelter. Uh, so what, what we did is we didn't know what we were gonna do in the end, but we knew that we had to do something. So we went and we interviewed all the uh, organizations that were trying to make a difference, but they weren't talking to each other. St. Vincent de Paul had never talked to the Methodist charities. Uh, Dorothy's Kitchen had never talked to uh, you know, the police. It was 
<laughs> and the police told us we were we, when we talked to them, uh, <laughs> we said, well, we want to know how to interview people to hold respect, you know, and, and uh, I didn't even pull my camera out sometimes. And this is something that students make a, a mistake sometimes. They don't, um, you, I always feel like you should give people the opportunity to not show their face, but tell their story. Um, because it felt it feels like you're honoring their story and not embarrassing so much. So in this case, I thought it was kind of interesting. This guy all dressed up uh, in a suit was uh, reading a book in this whole um, sort of depressing scene. And so on uh, this, this was a woman. So a lot of women have to hide when they're on the street. And, uh, and statistics show that a lot of them have um, mental illness either before or after they've been on the street for a while. So this was a woman sitting on a ledge in the church uh, outside. And I'm going to read you the poem that Fran wrote about this because we thought we'd find anger. <clears throat> Where's the anger? And we started it with a line from John Steinbeck that says, between hunger and anger is a thin line. This is not the depression, yet people wait in line for food jammed into a walkway outside the church. A sign at the curb says stop. Another says no left turn. A woman sits on a ledge beneath the stained glass window. She takes up little space. Masking tape holds her jeans together. Hunger, she says, has made it difficult to talk. It has hit her in the stomach like a silent fist that shatters to glass. It has cut the height of her body, the boom of the voice she once had. She is slowly being erased. The roll of her blanket, her small sack, a comb, or a mask holding her together. She even welcomes the lice. They make her scratch, bleed, remind her she is still here. So as an artist, when, you when I take photographs of, of of a document, I also feel there's got to be an artistic element to it, you know, or it's not powerful. And so it's interesting. I don't know if you can see, but this this guy in the food line has a bag that says uh, the good life, <laughs> the good life. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think it's important. And we became friends by sitting in food lines and talking to people. The veterans actually protected <laughs> one time. Uh, there was a, a person that had like an outbreak and he, um, he was, you know, very volatile and the, the veterans spoke up for me and protected me and I was able to just walk away quietly and it was fine. But, um, and there's all this food. So there, so each piece in the exhibition, there's 24 pieces in the exhibition, like a giant book. And each piece tells a story. This one was about all the food that's being thrown away. This one was about Lydia who, um, who was sleeping on the streets after having been married and, and abused. And I thought it was interesting, another, uh, because you're interested in the art side of this, I'm gonna talk about some of the uh, reasons why I, did, why I chose the photos. This photograph is outside of Rachel's Women's Center, but she has a sweatshirt that says USA on it. So those kind of things are, are um, important for the, making an image that's a story, you know? And this is Jake and he worked all his life in construction, but with automation, his job disappeared. And he, in, in um, San Diego, like a lot of um, urban communities, the uh, housing has changed. So affordable housing in downtown was demolished so that expensive condos could be built. And there was a waiting list of like three or four years for to try to get into places. Could be even longer. So we talked to Jake, and then Marilyn was a really interesting case because in in California, when Reagan was governor, 
there were two legislators, Short, Sharp and Doyle, and they wanted to let people that were uh, housed in mental institutions out so that they could um, at least have somewhat of a normal life, maybe have halfway shelters, neighborhoods, support centers. If they weren't violent and if they were, if they had support, they felt that would be much better than housing them in these giant institutions. Um, and Marilyn was one of those people that was in and out of the institutions. And she, she carried around this thick book with her uh, that she was writing. Um, and, and she would seem, you know, she, you were, I'm not gonna read the poem cause it's long, but she would start talking to you and it would seem like you, she was, you know, like a, um, I don't wanna say normal, but atypical person. And um, she, she had these grapes in her hands, which are round and she had a polka dot shirt, which is round. And she talked about mirroring people back to themselves. So that's why I photographed her in front of a plate glass window that was mirroring. And, uh, oh. and what happened with Sharp and Doyle in that legislation is they did let people out, 30,000 people out of the institutions. But instead of plan B, which was to have support systems, they cut plan B out of the budget completely. And uh, the, we met the aides for sh from Short, um, Short and Doyle later is after this. And they were, um, the legislators were devastated because they started out with a, 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 a bill that was supposed to help people and instead, caused you know a lot of heartache and death probably this is anita one way i was going to read you one way actually i'm going to read you um something that pertains more to what we're we're talking about today so um when we talk about law, you know, and what, what's happened, um, I guess I have a long history in this because um, this is a poem that Fran wrote called Who the Law Leaves Out. I'm gonna back it up to that one. Um, the law in its maj majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets and to steal bread. That was um, Anatoly, France, in 1901. So it's um, something people have been thinking about for a long time. Jesse, I meet Jesse, blue in the face, in 62, sleeping in private public library. She chooses the foreign language section. I worked 40 years as a cashier till my lungs gave out. Now. I sleep in the library. For 19 nights, I've been sitting downtown on a bus bench, fighting to keep my eyelids open. A police officer doing his job said, it's against the law for me to close my eyes. And it was interesting because when Fran and I talked to the police about how do we interview people, <laughs> they told us you can't look them in the eye. And, and it's because you know, panhandlers, if you look them in the eye, they, they're, they you know, what want to have help. But I'm telling you one day, and I didn't have much money. I was a single mom, like I said, I gave a dollar to a guy who had come to San Diego for a teaching job and the job was, uh, wasn't there. It was, um, I don't know all the details now, but he got down on his knees and cried when I gave him $1. It was, uh, and he said no one had talked to him in three days. So, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people and they'll go, well, if, if you talk to them, then they, you know, they want more. But sometimes you have to give people the benefit of the doubt. What, if no one talks to people, then how do you help anybody, you know? So, Kara, did you answer, um, there's a question here for you, permissions from people, and how do you describe your purpose to them? So, um, so 
this was in 1984 before anyone was really talking about homelessness. And there were 800 people at that time. No, 3,000 people on the streets in San Diego. There's a lot more than that now. And it's, it's an experience that's interesting because we, um, if, it's, if you take photographs in a public place, you don't have to have written permission, but if you do an individual, you do. And so that's what we did. We asked individuals when we told their story if they would give us permission and we had them sign a release. And, um, and we also changed their name. So we didn't use their original name uh, to protect them. And so that makes them feel more heard and, uh, and, and more empowered because they felt like they could have a voice. And we actually several times stood up for people at the shelter and places like that because we are empowered as white you know, women that were um, um, journalists. We felt like we could say things, but uh, that they weren't allowed to say. For instance, one time uh, we were at a courthouse and we had an appointment to talk to a judge who was trying to make a difference. And um, his name was Judge Coates. And we got to the, the courtroom door and it had one of those, you know, those glass, small, narrow glass windows that you could see through, but the door was locked and we didn't want to be late. And so um, Fran politely knocked on the door. There was a bailiff walking around in the courtroom and he ignored us as soon as he looked at us, just ignored us. And she knocked again, louder. And I thought we were gonna get thrown in jail. And, and he finally comes up, you know, and then of course, as soon as he opens the door, we said we have an appointment with Judge Coates and, and then he let us in, but, uh, we knew over and over again that that <laughs> our feelings were uh, we could make a difference, and we did make a difference. So that's one of the things that we could say. The mayor initiated initiated a task force. We took this exhibition to Sacramento. Well, actually, we didn't. Senator Wadi Detta and his team, a senator, state senator, took it, and he brought it to Sacramento and he hung it in the halls. So the legislators had to go buy the exhibition. Think of it as a giant book <clears throat> lining the hall. So when they went to the elevator or the restroom or a meeting, they walked by. And instead of a lobbyist running after them, we could watch. They would stop. One photograph in that show would stop their heart. And they would stop and read the story. And all of a sudden, people started asking Senator Wadi Detta, about his legislation to help that had been sitting on their desks for months. They flew, Fran and I, two artists, <laughs> up to Sacramento to meet with nine legislators that had some sort of legislation uh, to make a difference because there's jobs, there's housing, there's all these different things, health. And so we learned, wow, you know, there's not enough connection they're inundated with lobbyists, so they tune it out. It's almost like the homeless, you know, on a different scale, isn't it? And so, um, so then from from um, being in Sacramento, instead of being there one week, they kept it a full month. They said it was the most professional exhibition they'd ever had there. It was a really learning experience. And then from there, it went to the Capitol in Arizona. And then from there, it went to Washington, D.C. and was in Congress building. And, uh, and, and then after that, it's actually still in Washington on, uh, in the National Coalition for the Homeless offices. So it's been used at conferences. Do I have any questions? Because I'm going to give a, a little space between each exhibition so that you, um, so that you have a chance to ask questions. I have a question or a statement. Okay. This is Jill. Um, I actually did listen to this um, this morning when I was on a walk with my daughter. And so we both listened to it. Oh. But since we were walking, we didn't get to look at it. We just listened. That's interesting. 
How did that work? <laughs> um, it worked well because uh, some of the things you're saying are the same things that were in that um, 30 minute video. Yeah. Is that what you were referring to? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank I you. Have, I have a question for you, Kira. Okay. Uh, when, you, when you share about giving voice to the street people and your own voice as part of that, um, I'm, I'm fascinated with the sense of what does it mean to have a voice? What does it mean to have our voice? How do you distinguish some of that? Is your voice to be advocate or to be um, some kind of a window for the voice? I'd love to hear your your feelings on that. I think uh, it depends on the piece. So if you think there's 24 pieces in the show, some of them are set up as like Jake's story or Anita's story. Some of them are set up as our own uh, reflections on that, like where's the anger and uh, desaparecitas. Um, so, uh, and, and what was interesting about Home Street Home is that um, the Red Cross actually printed 300 copies of the book and gave those to all the actors and crew for Comic Relief. Have you ever heard of Comic Relief with Whoopi Goldberg and Robin Williams? It was a big HBO fundraiser for homelessness for many years. And, um, and that was interesting to us because to answer your question, I think it, gave pe it gives people insight into um, all the aspects of homelessness. One of the things that I think is good about what we did is we were both journalists before we were artists. And so everything was documented and researched. And so when, um, when we look at an issue, we look at what are the roots? You have senior citizens that were thrown out. You have jobs that change. You have health issues. You have mental illness. You have veterans with you know, drug and alcohol issues. There were all these different aspects of abuse, domestic abuse, all these different aspects that became part of the show. And that's why the Red Cross um, printed our book and, and wanted uh, the actors to know because a lot of times people um, don't really know what the roots are. And, and so it kind of became a process. Uh, Jill, you probably got that from that wa watching the video is, it became uh, a, our template for the next three exhibitions in the next 20 years. Um, and one of the things that uh, we do is we, we try to get media to understand and to pay attention. So, um, you know, this is from the, um, I think that was the union. This is an example of what we were part of in Washington, DC in the, the, this is in the Senate building. We also were in the Congress building. And this is like Barbara Bush and Tipper Gore. And uh, so it was a wives of both Democrats and Republicans, a partnership. Wouldn't that be nice to see more of that? <laughs> I wonder if they even do that anymore, you know? Um, and then, and also, you know, even at the university level, KPBS where I was working, a staff photographer was on the campus for San Diego State University. And, uh, and so I got, by doing this, we got to educate the students who weren't aware. That's Jesse, the one I, story I was telling you about. In the LA Times, they call us artist activists. <clears throat> we got an award in, um, for collaboration from the Senate in um, the California Senate. And this is just, I just wanted to show you since you're um, part of this university program that, the, that there were various universities across the states that have been involved in our work. And also like this is at Rutgers that they published a, a really long story about our work um, in, the, in their Voices publication. 
So this is the second exhibition. So uh, are there any more questions? Because I wanted to pause in between. I can't see everybody. So if there are hands raised, um, just speak up. Girl, this is Kate. Um, how, and I don't, you may not know this, how was your exhibition received in the homeless community? Um, what did people think of it? Did you have any reaction? Um, that's a good question. And over and over again, people that were on the streets would come to our exhibitions. We have, we, we hired a guy. Um, I mean, it hurts my heart because we tried so much to help. And there were so many times when um, we thought we could make a difference and we did, didn't. And, um, and so we had to live with the fact that we could make some difference, but we can't solve it all. You know, uh, when we were in Washington, DC though, it was really interesting because um, there was this young guy who um, played the guitar and he, he was actually doing some work for a friend of mine because I have a friend on Capitol Hill who um, who's like me, community artist. <laughs> and, and so he was, I paid him $50 to come to the opening and play music at the opening with all the senators and con Congress people. And he was so proud, he took that $50 and went to Salvation Army and bought a new suit just so he could be proud when he played. So what we learned is um, sometimes it's moments that make people have a change or when to, sometimes it's moments that make people want to live, you know? Right now with Compassionate Arts, um, we hear those kind of stories a lot. I, I don't know if it's because of COVID, but probably that has a lot to do with it. But a, a lot of our youth have been suicidal. I mean, the suicide rate is really high. So we've been doing a lot of mental health um, projects, uh, trying to give a voice to the anxiety that's happening, to to the feelings and, and bringing in therapists and the arts, because we believe that the arts help heal. And so, and I, th you know, to go back to your question, in, a, in, in one way, I feel that um, the art gives them a voice without embarrassing them, you know? And so um, that, that was the point. I mean, when, at one time I remember telling a student who said, I tried to photograph the people that were homeless and, and they just ran away from me. And I said, well, did you just like stick your camera in their face? How would you feel if, <laughs> how would you feel if you were at the lowest part in your life and somebody comes up to you and just sticks a camera in your face, how would you feel? And so it, it became a teaching moment for me to be able to talk to students about that. You know, I didn't pull my camera out a lot of times until I, I got permission and, and people felt safe. And I knew I had a cause. I didn't just photograph this for a class project. I was doing this to make a difference. To prove, <laughs> to prove the Attorney General of the United States was wrong, right? So um, mm -hmm. that's, you know, I don't know where that all came. My mother was a social worker. Maybe it came from that. And my parents were both Democrats. And so maybe it came from that. I don't know. But, <laughs> and also maybe it came from, you know, struggling as a single mom. I mean, uh, I think what, you know, that saying, um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Um, is there thank any you more for that? I, I, thank you're you. Welcome. You're welcome. Any more questions on, can I go forward? So struggle to be born, um, was our second exhibition. This is the book cover. And, um, we put a man a father holding a baby on the cover because we wanted people to see lack of prenatal care for poor women as an issue that affects everyone. And, uh, and often the, the fathers and the men get forgotten in these and they should be brought in to it. So we uh, so remember how I said we uh, struggled with a home street home. 
how we bring in all the roots of the problem. So we looked at struggle to be born. Why were 300 women a month being turned away from the hospitals in San Diego? Why was this happening statewide? Why was it happening national? And one reason is that the, um, they have midwives, nurse midwives, and they weren't allowing more than 100 a month to, to be birthed with them. So they were limiting, even though there was a possibility of helping make a difference. And, uh, and when this show was in um, Sacramento, so we did the same thing. We had it in, in exhibitions in San Diego and then it went to Sacramento and um, Washington DC. And um, what we did was we, we got the, the San Diego State University Press printed it. Um, we got the foreword from the um, president of the American College of Obstetricians and, and PBS actually did a program because of our exhibition. And in San Diego, that program embarrassed the OBGYNs and they voted to each take one or two non-pain patients a month. And they felt that the reimbursement rate for Medicare or Medi-Cal, uh, which is the low income reimbursement rate was too low for them to take on. So that was one reason for the problem too. So like I said, the roots of the problem are many, but what we did was each piece would kind of talk about that. So that's, a, that's another cause and effect. Wow. <laughs> that, you know, um, this is uh, Joshua. And let me, I, I wanna read you his poem, Fran wrote. Now, so Fran, Francis Payne Adler was my poet partner in, the, in this for, for 20 years. And she, before that was a nurse in Canada an emergency room nurse. So she wrote this, this was the first poem she wrote when we started this exhibition. Joshua, I could hold you Joshua in the palm of my life, cup my 40 years around your hanging flesh and say, what have we done? I could hold you say, you are not my son, hold you, tell you lies, that all babies are born as you are, bound to breathing machines, their bodies small enough to fit a hand and weighing less than two pounds, that all babies are born equal, that I can look you in the eye. This is no lie that the moon of your birth night tracked your mother from hospital to hospital, spilled its cool light on insurance ledgers, weighing your worth, that her fertile heart froze to sand each time she was turned away. That at 20, I was a nurse, starched and stupid with notions of night sirens unloading pain at emergency room doors as call to care. I hold you, Joshua, in my palm. Your chest blows the breathing machine and the walls of my denial tumble. So when I photographed Joshua, it was interesting because I was in the ICU, in the baby's nursery, and I had my camera and it was really affecting me physically. You know, I was just, <clears throat> I can even feel it now, all these years later. And I was looking at this one particular baby and all of a sudden he opened his eye and looked straight at me. And I took the picture, of course. But if you think about how I framed it as an artist, I didn't just take his face. I got the little blankets with the teddy bears in it because it pulls in our universal caring that way. If you if you connect into maybe memories or people or things that people care about. And so, um, <clears throat> so struggle to be born included stories. This is a, a mother who uh, the clinic, when she had her second child documented 
her first birth, had documented her first birth, she, uh, her baby on the right, the older child here, was born um, se severely mentally um, disabled. And she didn't have much money, but she made an agreement with a doctor to do filing. Is that something that I would, do we have to pay attention to that? Okay. I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, so anyway, she'd make an, she'd made an agreement with a doctor to work in his office doing filing in return he was going to give her prenatal care and check her, her vitals and, and make sure she was okay. He never weighed her, never checked her blood. She, her baby was born with hypoxia, which is a, 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 a signal the, ba the baby sends and the, it's breathing that could have been prevented, the baby's di um, disability, if he had just listened to that pain. And so I'm not gonna, the poem's long, but it's just, it's a beautiful poem. Fran calls her Honor Maria. And I'll read the last two lines. Sometimes I get angry. If he had just taken more time, watched for signals. He never weighed me, checked my blood. If he had listened to that pain, maybe he could have done something. But he was rough, too much in a hurry. I remember after Raffaella was born, he didn't freeze me when he sewed me. It hurt, hurt more than the birth. I screamed, but he kept right on sewing as if I were a cow or a donkey. So um, that poem has affected people, it affects me. Um, one time we were uh, giving a presentation to the Seroptimus Club in, um, in La Mesa, California. And this woman came up to us after, well, a lot of them did, but this one particular woman, she was a really tough uh, <laughs> looking, you know, strong looking woman. And she, she came up to us and she was crying. And uh, she said that, and she was the CEO owner of a trucking company. Can you imagine? And she said that that was her experience of birth. That, that she wasn't listened to and that she just, you know, was just there and it really brought back memories. And what was really good about it was the first time she had talked about it. And it was a release to feel that there were other people, other women that have had that experience and that we can make a change. And I actually worked with midwives a lot um, <laughs> after uh, this project. Um, for a couple of years, I was so. This is this. I don't know if you can see the nurse is uh, or the doctor is is checking the baby. The baby's crying, and the nurse, the doctor's button says, "We make babies happy." <laughs> can you see that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so those are the kinds of things that when you take photographs, um, you know, do you the photographer should think about. You know, like here's a nurse doing uh, checking the heartbeat of the baby. And in the background, there's a poster with the baby in a, a woman's tummy. So that that's, you know, mm -hmm. relating. So people know what they're talking about. Um, and this is a, a just, I, so one of, the, one of the biggest things that I have had um, surprise about is that a lot of artists, especially photographers, photographic artists, they think that if they have a cause, they have to photograph terrible, ugly things. And if you don't include beauty in a project like this, you lose a big opportunity to help people connect. It's super important and very few artists realize it. I did a project against building a dam on the Carmel River and um, I worked for a year and I invited 50 photographers because I was part of the Ansel Adams Club in, in, <laughs> in Monterey. I lived there 20 years. And, and all these great photographers, landscape photographers and people photographers, and they didn't know what to do. It was amazing. And they thought they had, like, they would come back with a sign, you know, and, and 
it was the first time in the history of the United States they were taking acreage that was protected wilderness out of wilderness protection for a, a project like a dam. And I found out that the area they they were taking out of wilderness protection was this beautiful waterfall with all these trees and all this beauty and the, and the land they were swapping was like this you know deserty kind of like hillside rocky and nothing would have grown on it it was just it was crazy and so i asked them that little by little i got them to realize that it was the beauty that makes people care and all you really need is one are two images that have what the reality or the consequence will be. The rest of the show can be about, uh, this is, you know, this mother was singing to her, her daughter or her kids. This would, and we include history a lot of times in our exhibitions, which is really important. So this is Grandma Lee, and she's talking about how, uh, how she burst on the farm, which probably in Minnesota that might, um, that, might relate to a few of the old, older people, right? <laughs> um, this, is, uh, this is also um, in the exhibition. It uh, goes with a line from one of Fran's poems that's, I am the sweat of a mother's child in fever. And so this is a, a, a woman that I knew. She was a student and she had two little boys. And this is the little boy that she was thinking of giving up for adoption because she felt like she couldn't afford to feed both of them. And then, so there's this park in Chicano, we call it Chicano Park that has a lot of murals in it. So I took her there to photograph her because of the beauty of the symbolism. And there was one piece we talked about the roots of the problem. There's uh, one piece in the show about uh, around the world, what other countries are doing and what we're doing here. And also we have like um, doctors' voices, <laughs> all the people. And this one started with this OBGYN who was trying to make a difference, but malpractice insurance was so high that a lot of obstetricians he, uh, were, you know, all over the United States, a lot of obstetricians were uh, just getting out of birthing, not because they wanted to, but because malpractice was so expensive. And I thought it was interesting when he said, I once saw a bumper sticker, send your son to medical school. It said, support my son, the lawyer. For him, those are fighting words. And he went, he went to Washington to lobby about it. I also went to Mexico and uh, photographed midwives there. Um, so again, the beauty and the, and the connections. So when we did the, we interviewed um, three social workers from around the world who happened to be at a conference. <laughs> you have to, you have to take opportunities, right? When it happens, um, there were the, so this, there was a social worker conference in San Diego from uh, people all over the world. And so we went, we got an opportunity to talk to them. And this is Christine from Singapore and, and, um, we told her story, but before that, we used a quote from a, um, Dr. Miller, who's a professor and chairman of the Department of Maternal and Child Health at, at uh, Chapel Hill. The issue of providing adequate preventive care for pre pregnant women in the US is neither medical nor financial, it is political. The means are available to do a better job. Many counties with fewer resources, countries, with fewer resources than the US are doing it. So we don't, we don't pretend to know, I mean, it's not our job to know all the possibilities of solutions, but we do encourage people to, to know that there are people out there who have done the research. And in Washington, we often found um, people that needed uh, to have their research heard and this using art is one way for, for people to have their research heard. When I was at Cal State University Monterey Bay for eight years, I taught uh, art and social change. And uh, I worked as visual consultant for the capstone students, which are senior students. So these students have gone four years to um, 
university, they're required to have a visual or artistic component of their capstone, their senior presentation, which is about five minutes at the end with, before they graduate, showing their research. And they would sometimes be crying because they didn't know how to make their research into a visual representation. And one way I was able to help them is you don't have to show faces. You don't have to show, you can have images that are symbolic. You know, it's interesting that people don't even think like that sometimes. Um, and, and they're not being taught. And that's a big loss because if you can't get your research heard or seen or understood, especially understood, that's where art can really help, then it, it kind of feels like a waste to me. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, so now we're on to the third, uh, the, um, third exhibition. Any questions? So Kara, I thought Sherry um, had something profound. The words speak to my mind, the photographs speak to my heart, the combination speaks to my conscience. Thank you, Sherry, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, maybe that is one of the greatest things about the arts is that we can make those connections when sometimes our legislators or policymakers or teachers just feel overwhelmed and don't remember that. Like the podcast that we have going right now, When Black and Brown Go Green, it's really interesting. <laughs> I, because Fe Felicia started it as part of Compassionate Arts, I'm keeping art in conversation. And there are doctors and lawyers and environmentalists in that group and they don't know what I mean it, it, it to me it's a little shocking how little they know about how art can make a difference it's it's really surprising you know and and part of that is the arts can bring people together but we we've cut it out of our schools so where are people getting art and if they're not, and especially with COVID, how are they getting art? How are they, how are they using it to connect with their own families, with their own communities, with their own friends? You know, um, I'd be interested to hear from you all about that kind of thing. Do you include art in your family or in your friends' interaction? Yes. Can you give me an example? I have a group of friends that I met through art classes and um, we get together once a week now and take a walk. And part of what we do while we're walking is talk about what art we've seen during the week, um, often online now, but um, so we try and keep thinking about it and um, keep it in our minds, but I think Part of taking this class is we want to know what we can do um, as far as the social justice end of it. So this is, I think, really helpful um, for our group. Thank you. I mean, because a lot of people can take photographs, right? Uh, <laughs> and and it, especially with our phones now. I mean, uh, I don't know if they would have gotten that verdict without those, you know, that video, you know, and and. and um, I used to, I, I, I started, um, when I was in Monterey, I did a lot of different jobs. I was director of the, of arts and education for the county through the arts council for a couple of years. And I started, um, art classes in migrant farm worker communities, which was pretty amazing. And I think every community should have those kind of classes. The whole family could come together. How often do you sit down with your parents and your siblings and make something that's meaningful? You know, we would make books on our life. We would, <laughs> we would make mosaics. That the men love that one. Um, we would, we would bring in people. I one time I brought this opera singer who had been from around the world in to talk to them, 
and and <laughs> Louis, Louis, he was about six four, big guy, you know. And and you can imagine we had like fifty people in the room. We we met in the library com community room, and I'm just it's just kind of a sidetrack, but it's kind of a fun story to tell because if you think about communities, especially black and brown communities, often they stay to themselves because they're afraid. They don't go out like in Monterey, which is has like you think of Carmel and the beach in Monterey County, you know, well, there are all these towns along the 101, the middle of the, you know, like less than 30 miles away. And some of them have never seen the beach because they're afraid to go out of their communities. And so I would bring people in to them, to the classes, and we would use art to talk about um, drug and alcohol abuse, because some of their parents were pretty, uh, just say, emotionally destroyed. And, um, and so we would help the kids or just give, uh, sometimes we'd have three or four languages in the class. And, uh, and I'd have a five-year-old translating Treaky, you know, which is a Oaxacan language you know, to a farm worker who's actually still on my Facebook. <laughs> he uses translation to talk to me and he, he loves the planet and he does all this art and he's like in some remote place in Mexico now. But um, it's all I'm saying is that if you, th if you, when you live your life, see, try and, and things happen in your family and you want to talk about it, if you can figure out some art project and I have lots of tutorials that, can open it up and it's not so intimidating. Son that's been bringing my car in there. Pardon? So he's here now with your vehicle. Um, he had a, uh, a new battery for the <laughs> What's going on? I think Liz Speak. needs to um, mute Liz, herself. Liz, get closer to your mic. We can't hear you. I think she's gone. I, I can, can we mute her? Liz needs to mute herself, I think. I'll mute her. And I think there you go. Thanks. Okay. So um, anyway, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I want to encourage all of you to use arts. You know, I love that you walk uh, and talk about art and, you know, and that you're outside because uh, nature to me is a real inspiration. Um, so that's great. And, uh, you know, feel free to contact me after this if you want ideas. So When the Bow Breaks was the third exhibition that we did, Pregnancy and the Legacy of Addiction. It was nominated uh, by the American Library Association as one of the top books for teens that year. Um, and, the, and the reason is that drug and alcohol use during pregnancy um, was something no one was talking about, and yet it, it was affecting lives. And in California, there was a big debate whether they throw women in jail and treat it as a crime, or whether, like the American Medical Association says, treat it as a health issue because women would run away. Mm -hmm. They'll never, the, they felt that we'd never resolve it if we didn't treat it as a health issue. And so, um, this was probably the hardest exhibition that Fran and I have ever done because we care about the moms as feminists and we care about the babies and we care about the moms and then we care about the babies. And what we found in our research is that 60 to 80% of the women have been abused as children. And so there is a cycle that's not being talked about. And that cycle is, um, is important to break the silence, as Fran says, and important to breaking the silence. And so when we, <laughs> when this exhibition went to Sacramento, the March of Dimes took it up there. And there was a, a, a um, legislative, women's legislative caucus that was one of our sponsors. And Senator Calais, Lucy Calais, became our spokesperson. And when it went, when it was supposed to hang in the Capitol, when we got up there, half the show wasn't hanging. Half the show. What happened shocked us. They took out all the compassion. 
And all you saw was this sort of damning side of things instead of seeing the balance of how the roots of the problem, where they come from. And so we, we had to call in the ACLU. And Fran, in our book, did three pages of um, about the censorship because it's something that people need to know. You know, uh, they actually we called in the ACLU and we had this big meeting in the senator's office and we, we were just artists. We didn't know what we were doing. And so we, um, we luckily um, had friends who are, were attorney and we stood in there and they took each of my artworks. Can you imagine how that felt? Each of my artworks I had to defend. And this is a show about drug and alcohol use during pregnancy. And that this one was, was, uh, censored. Uh, how do you do a show? You know, this, they have nude statues everywhere in the Capitol, but this was offensive because they said it was obscene. It was about a woman um, becoming emaciated from the drugs. So um, they backed down. We, we, uh, we won our, our fight in that case. But three days after we left Sacramento, they took the show down. So did we win? I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I still don't know. I know that after our exhibition, they passed a rule that you couldn't have anything political in the house of politics, right? <laughs> I know, it's a, amazing. This is like what, so alcohol and drug use during pregnancy was the thing, was the, core of this exhibition and, and telling stories so that uh, there are solutions that are compassionate. And this is a crib on a baby's grave. Um, and this, this mom, was, she talked about uh, how hard it was when all your friends are doing drugs and they kept saying, hit this, hit this, come on, you can do it. You know, it's not, you know, how it, it's just this peer pressure. So um, that was part of that exhibition. And um, this is tunnel vision. I'm going to just re read you that poem. You've got, you've got a question, Kira, about okay. um, consulting mental health professionals when you're working on these projects. Oh, definitely. There are all, always, we work with their, um, people that are experts. Even now, with all the projects we have, we have subject matter experts. And, uh, and I can tell you that the women in this exhibition and book when the bow breaks, they're all in recovery programs. And the, the recovery programs felt that if the women tell their stories, it will help them stay clean. And so they wanted to tell their story very much. But in some cases, like in this case, she was very afraid of the ex-husband who was abusive. So remember how I was saying, I teach artists how to take powerful images without showing faces. So um, she was homeless for a while. So I took her out in the street and I photographed her with her, her shadow and her son's shadow. But I cropped it so that what you see, even if it's kind of a subconscious, is this halo on the above the boy's head in the shadow. Tunnel vision. People don't understand when I try to be honest and tell them, yeah, I was an abuser, but yet I was abused. They don't understand that. Tessa, at what time in the tunnel did the gentle inhabitants of her body pack up and leave? At what time did her father's beer take the house hostage and she learned to live with too much sadness? He said I had to, and I better not tell. At what time did steel plank itself beneath her skin and ropes begin to bind her blood? What are these ropes and how long the tunnel? So when I was at, at um, Cal State University Monterey Bay, I, I would... Um, give this lecture kind of like what I'm doing with you guys. 
and I and I would bring the books and I would have students read some of the poems. And I was trying to figure out if I could do that with you guys, you all, but I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, but I, I think it's powerful to have people actually read the words of other people, you know? But I wanted to leave you with some happiness. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, this is a, a woman that's recovered who's smiling at you. And she is now a therapist. And she's happy because this mom went through a program, is clean, and has a healthy baby. So in, in that, the woman that's on the cover of the book, Christine or Denise, she, um, she actually did the same thing. She went through a program, and, um, and she is a counselor now. She got her degree, and she's a counselor. Somebody had a hand up, I thought, for a second. Lori? No, that was a reaction clap. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> so um, I put this in to, because I do something that a lot of photographers don't do. I love the surreal. And I especially love the surreal in photography because we're used to thinking of photographs as factual. But sometimes the reality of the surreal is impossible to put in a photograph. You have to do something different when you hear a story. And um, Fran wrote a story called Speak Body. Let me see what. I wasn't going to read it, but I think it might because it, it goes with this poem. It's like um, you you know you hear a story or something that that feels really strong and you can't think of how you could possibly show a photograph that fits i did have it marked that fits um the story because it here's what the mother said giving up the drug was hell like ripping my skin off like turning myself inside out. But there was this whole new person underneath. Um, it's kind of a long poem, so I'm not going to read the poem, but you can see, um, I, <laughs> I was at the time I was into doing this, um, this art with sausage casings. <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to work with, but <clears throat> what's really cool about it is it holds the shape. So I had this female form and I used it to make the, can you see the body of her body here? And on the, on the desk, here is her nose and her mouth. And this is her hand. <laughs> and, um, and it's like in the poem, she talks about shedding her skin and hanging it up to dry. So Fran wrote a poem that was surreal too. So as an artist, you don't want to be limited all the time because life, life isn't always limiting. The things that we experience can't always be put into words or reality. It's just that's, a, I mean, if we as artists don't realize that we're losing a, a huge opportunity to have fun with our art, to have, uh, you know, the surprise element, which I love. If you saw my exhibition with the projections of the art to change the world, the Sea Changes exhibition, you'll, you'll remember that I projected on the silks, um, the ocean creatures, but I, I did, uh, you know, I did things that were, were like, I, the seahorses, instead of being three inches, were eight feet tall. And I, and I photograph fish in fish tanks in, in restaurants, you know, how in seafood restaurants, sometimes they'll have an aquarium. <laughs> and so the, these fish are like looking at you and they're usually like three or four inches and they're like giant fish swimming past you and, and on you because this, that's why I use silk so people can have it on them. And so that was, that was really cool. And, and, and interesting, Barbara, do you remember that uh, mom that brought the little girl that was on the autism spectrum. Yeah, and, she left. And they they took one of the cloaks and the, and she just she got into this whole uh, beautiful dance. And the mother was totally 
blown away because of, of her daughter all of a sudden participating in something that was like that. You know? Yeah, I remember that. It was a powerful moment. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Yeah. You've got a technical question here. What camera and equipment do you use more most often? And do you always work in black and white? So um, that, has, that has changed. So I've used, um, I use black and white on certain things that <clears throat> where I want people to pay more attention to um, the emotion. Sometimes, I mean, this show has some color, but majority of it's black and white. What I do now uh, is primarily color, but I still do some black and white. Um, I have a lot more painting in my work now than I used to. Uh, I used, I have Nikons, Leicas, Canon. I've had every kind of eight by 10, five by seven, uh, two and a quarter and 35 millimeter. I, um, and my exhibitions that you're seeing have used a lot of those different cameras. So you're talking, you're looking at um, 20 years of work. Um, this is Denise. That's the one I was telling you about. This has been the learning year. So the, so the end of the exhibition is positive so that people can, um, can feel the change and the hope. Because I think hope is really important. Did I answer that technical question enough? Do you feel whoever asked? I use, yes. so, so now I still have 35 millimeter cameras, but I don't use film, obviously I'd use digital. Um, but you know, my favorite is my iPhone. I mean, the, the iPhone, video is as good as my $4,000 video camera. It's remarkable. I project some of those projections that I did on that um, ACW installation were from my phone, which was shocking to me because I, I used to cart around all this equipment. <laughs> I would say audio is still not as good, but visually, um, the phone handles low light situations better and is incredibly sharp for most use. I, I, um, I have, when I have shows and exhibitions uh, like museums, I have, um, I don't have any, I have one here, but I'm not gonna show you. Uh, I normally enlarge them to, um, they're in 30 by 40 inch frames and I paint on them. So I use pastels and paints and inks. So um, some of the or some of the current exhibitions are have are like that. Um, so I just wanted to um, give you a short poem that goes with this photograph. It's called "The Opening." I no longer hold back. Hold back a part of me. Hold back the great dark bird, sleek and shuddering. Beneath my skin, I'm opening, opening to exquisite flight. So the so it is sometimes remarkable when when you give people the opportunity to be who they want to be. Um, sometimes it's surprising. One of the things that is concerning me right now is young people like my granddaughter who's 13 who's always been this exuberant, jumping, dancing, singing child, hit 12 and 13 and became depressed and full of anxiety and suicidal. And it was shocking. It's still shocking. She, she has dark, you know, she paints her eyes dark underneath her. She wears black all the time. I know it's a stage, you know, <laughs> but I pray that, you know, um, and, and it's, it's hard because that's where community comes in. You know, family is not as important as other people in that age group. And so um, and that's one of the things we're working on is trying to get that back to that freedom of feeling good in your body and being, you know, happy and full of life. And 
how are we doing on time? Um, so um, this is the, the last exhibition that Fran and I did together. It's not my last exhibition, but it's the last exhibition. It's called A Matriot's Dream Healthcare for All. Unfortunately, it's still an issue in the United States. Obama Care tried to resolve it. And, and we were on TV with President Clinton when uh, Hillary was trying to make universal health care happen. Um, and we were so hopeful in those days. <laughs> we gave him a copy of the exhibition in a book form. And, and the, the word matria is a word that Fran made up during Desert Storm. Do you remember Desert Storm years ago? <laughs> and they called this missile the, the Patriot missile. And we were using it to bomb people. And um, Fran was a professor at that point and she was sitting at her desk and she said, well, if that's what a Patriot means, what would a Matriot mean? And so she made a definition, just like you see in the dictionary, and it's actually being used now. And the poster that we did with it is all over the world. <laughs> we got a, a, a note from somebody in Germany in a, a military, military mess hall that has the poster. You'll see the photo in a minute. And this definition, one who loves his or her country, one who loves and protects the people of his or her country, and one who perceives national defense as health, education, and shelter of all people in his or her country. And she's actually added in the world now. And this is the Matriot. <laughs> and so um, I'll give you a background because it's kind of fun. The Matriot is Grandma Helen, who is 92 years old, and she uh, was the grandmother of my ex-husband, who uh, we dearly loved, and she included me as her grandchild, <laughs> and even though I was an adult, and she, every, every month, she would write a letter, this is something we could all do, because I, I, I see a lot of people that are maybe grandparents on here, um, I, valued those little letters that she sent and she would stamp them on the outside save the redwoods ban the guns and all these things you know so she was a true matriot and so i asked her if she would be in a photo <clears throat> sure dears and so she's short <laughs> and so um fran and i had been doing research uh, for days at this foundation in San Francisco. And I'm telling you, people that were being turned away, all these letters, it was the Health Access Foundation. And people all over had written stories about being turned away. And Fran and I, I just said, I don't think I can do this exhibition. It's too, you'll, you'll see why in a minute. It's just too close to home. I can't do it. And she goes, well, let's do something powerful. Let's do something that makes us feel like we're making a difference, you know? And so we walked, but let's go eat. <laughs> her, her thing was protein. We need protein, you know? So we, 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 we left the foundation. We walked out in the parking lot and right next to the car on, wall, on the wall in graffiti was revolution. The day has come. And so Fran looked at me and she goes, oh, let's do something with that. And I go, well, let's see if we put college students in front of it, what would that do? And that, and that would be like, so typical people wouldn't pay attention. And so then we thought, well, what if we had mothers pushing baby carriages? That would be kind of cool too. And then I thought about grandma Helen and the matriot definition. And so I called up Grandma Helen and, and we went and picked her up and, um, and she gets out in the parking lot with her cane and her pearls are on and she goes, you want me to be this little old lady, right? And we said, no, we want you to be strong. And she raised her fist and I got the photo. And so uh, she's forever immortalized, right? Kira, could we see the, the definition of matriot one more time? Thank you. You're welcome. Perfect, thank you. There is, the exhibition is online, by the way, if you look up matriot.org. Oh, great. Um, 
what I what I put this in the I put a couple of images in here to show you some of the compromises that artists have to make. So this is Rutgers uh, University's um, public voices uh, that publication that they publish. Do you see how they cut revolution out? I mean, inside they did the whole photo, but it is kind of interesting from a perspective that they cut, that when we went to Washington DC with the Matriot's dream, we were, um, when President Clinton became president, uh, the, uh, they had a conference called the next 100 days and senators and legislators from all over were there. We had a funder who was willing to send, pay for us to go and for the exhibition to go, which is big because there's 12 crates. They're pretty heavy, hefty, they're 20, 30 by 40 inch frames. Um, and the funder was supportive of healthcare for all, but felt the word revolution was, he didn't want it at the conference. And so I could have said, well, then we're not going to show it, which a lot of artists would. But I thought, hmm, how can I make this work? <laughs> and so um, I told him, okay, I'll make another. He said he was willing to pay for a, another whole piece. So I did, I did a photograph with Grandma Helen, and I put behind it in the framed. I don't have a photo of it right now, but uh, behind her with her fist raised, I put faces and a, a, a transparent American flag and behind the transparent American flag, I put all kinds of faces, old, young, different ethnicities behind it. And then it still has the definition, but just the word revolution's not in it. And I, uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I will do another piece. I did not say I won't send the revolution image to Washington, DC. And so I sent both. <laughs> and um, and we, I, I, I did what I said. I didn't show it at the conference, but we did show it in Washington, DC in several places. So I, as artists, there are decisions that we have to make as public artists. There's always a point of, of you as an artist, as a person, are entitled to say whatever you feel and think through your art, because that's your right. But if you want to make a difference with community and public art, you have to always take into consider consideration um, how people will feel, how they react, how you can make it work, how you can compromise. And one of the things that really concerns me about this generation that we have right now is I don't see negotiation, mitigation, compromise as even being on the table sometimes. And that that really worries me. This is a poem, um, it was on the cover of Fran's book uh, po of poetry and making of a matriot. This is how I'm going to end with um, my story. So I was, this is me. 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, no, it was 30 years ago because I got cancer 30 years ago. I got ovarian cancer six months after I left PBS. I left to do my, uh, uh, my art full time. I had a grant to do When the Bow Breaks book. And, um, and I fell in love with a man in Monterey. And that's how I ended up in Monterey. And, um, and so uh, six months later, I got ovarian cancer. I was given a 50% chance of living. Some people say I'm a miracle. I guess I am in some ways. Um, it was horrendous. I mean, seriously horrendous. Um, I was on an experimental program with chemo that almost killed me three times. And, um, and so I felt like I lost who I was. Fran, wrote a poem called Disembodied about my experience. And um, cause I was in bed for a year, pretty much sick all the time, throwing up, it was awful. 
uh, I would, it's not a diet I would suggest to people. Um, but one of the things that came out of it was this photo. And I don't know if you can see, but what I did was I would wake up in the morning and my hair, you saw my hair, right? My hair uh, was all over the pillow and from the chemo. It was surreal. Remember how I was talking about things that happen mm -hmm. in your real life that aren't, they're just too surreal to be real, you know? And so I, mm -hmm. I, I put my wig on my, on my pillow and I had hot flashes so bad. I'd be in a restaurant and I just like, take that wig off. You know, it's like it's too hot, you know, and you do kind of develop a weird sense of humor about it all. Um, but what I love about this photograph is I put the camera on the tripod because some of you had asked technical questions. So I had the camera on a tripod and I went and I got in the bed and I slowly got up and looked at the camera. And when you do a time exposure on film, you, it records light more than dark. So my head, as you see, disappears here and my face is here. But when you see this photograph on the wall, my eyes follow you because a time exposure, I must have looked two different directions. And it's really, it's a very haunting image, but it also was a storytelling image. Cause I had like all these stuffed animals people gave me. I had all this uh, supplements and medicine I had to take. I read every book I could find on cancer and healing. Uh, I had all my family photos here. Um, someone gave me a skull, a deer skull. And I don't know, you know, surreal, right? <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's what happened. So it's what triggered a Matriot Stream Healthcare for All. I left PBS after working there 10 years with excellent healthcare. I tried to get health insurance. It was so expensive as an individual that I thought, well, I'm young. I've been healthy all my life. What can happen in a year? Six months later, I got ovarian cancer and I had no insurance. Jesus. Oh. I had a doctor walk away from me, a doctor walk away from me after he told me I probably had cancer. And I told him I, I had done enough of my own exhibitions to know I had to go on Medicare or Medi-Cal, which is the indigent program, I had to go bankrupt. And um and I had a social worker tell me I had to be terminal to get care. So Keith and I got in the car and we came back to San Diego. And because of my work, that saved my life. I had a doctor in San Diego agree to do whatever it took to help me without payment if, I, if he didn't get it. It took six months for Medi-Cal Medi to come through to be approved. They make it, they make no way for you to contact them or anything once you apply. It was horrendous. And uh, I had a head of a clinic fight for me to be on the county program. It was amazing. At the same time, it was awful. It was also amazing because people were standing up for me and helping me. So when Fran and I did a Matria's dream, it was emotional, as you can see. Um, and what about the people that were being turned away? So she wrote a poem about people. It's called the turned away ones. And uh, um, <laughs> this comes from an experience. Um, when I had my first surgery, they thought I had breast cancer that had metastasized on my ovaries after a seven hour operation they came out and told my family pretty much that I was going to die. I was 39. And why is this emotional after all these years, you know? Anyway, um, I woke up after that surgery. So I went to men through menopause overnight. Can you imagine that? I had like 105 fever. It was so amazing. And the nurses, 
had taken those white surgical gloves and stuffed them with the square ice cubes, you know, that you get in ball games and stuff. And so I woke up in the morning and after surgery, and I had these arthritic looking white hands all over my body. Can you believe that? I was raised Catholic. I thought I got into purgatory. <laughs> it's just, you, you know, it was the anesthesia, I'm sure. But um, so when Fran wrote the poem about people being turned away, I said, I know the photo. I know what would be go along with this. I mean, we thought about shooting a graveyard and we thought about, shoot, we did shoot this little girl's room that died because she couldn't get care, you know, things like that. But in, a, in how do you get one image to tell a story about people being turned away and dying, you know, it's, that goes with the poem. And so what's interesting about this photograph, I don't know if you can see, but there's American flag. You see the flag flying in the back? You, you see that it's twisted? So that was a gift from God. So I, I called up after I got well and we were doing the exhibition, I called up a friend of mine who was at um, the county hospital in Monterey. And I said, I need a big, beautiful light. I need a, a window and I need a hospital bed. And I brought a box of stuffed gloves, but of course I couldn't stuff them with ice because they become balloons when the ice melts. So uh, my friends and I had a little styrofoam party and we broke up little those um, styrofoam peanuts into squares like the ice cubes look and stuffed them into the gloves and and I brought a box of the gloves up to this room you know that they arranged for me to be in and I had my camera to talk about the technical person I had my eight my two and a quarter camera heavy camera like a house of blood on a, a tripod and I put the and they had me in a room with four uh, women, three women who had had babies. So it was really interesting. <laughs> and then um, one of the women got up to go out of uh, the room with her baby. And they were all talking to us. You know, we're all talking about what the project was about. And by this time, I had doctors and interns and all, I don't know, in the room watching us. And I noticed there was a twisted flag hanging outside the window on the other side of the room. And so I said, move the bed. <laughs> and we all moved the bed and I got the photograph. Of course, nowadays you can just do it in Photoshop, but. Um... So Kara, this was a powerful testimony. Thank you so much for sharing this. This photograph is just amazing. Thank we you. are five minutes over and oh, they sorry. sometimes have, a, they have other classes that they're going to. So okay, thank you, sorry. What a, way, what a way to wrap this up. Um, <laughs> yeah, when, you, when you're 70, you've lived a life, haven't you? Mm. Yeah, anyone have any la last comments? Thank you so much. Thank Kira. you. Yeah, yes. very incredible. Very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all for being here and listening and go out and make some art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're working on that, aren't we people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. as, as usual, I'd love to have any testimonies you want to send that we could add to the website. And thank you so much for joining us and I'll see you next week with Lori. Bye-bye. Hasta Bye, luego. Bye. <clears throat> Liz, are you still here? Your your mic's off. Your mic's off. <clears throat> Turn your mic on. There we are. Yes, uh, Jim is still in town, and so can we be virtual for Friday on our talk? Sure, sure yeah. we can. We can.